Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, from whatever parts of the world you might find yourself in. Um, hello, um, Abrina, Abrina Manji, welcome. Um, welcome, um, Dismaip, and also welcome, Maria, uh, from the University of Cape Town, as well as uh, Dr. Zubike from Lorin. Um, um, it has been a bit of struggle for me getting online this morning. Yes, wasted my 30 minutes, but thank God for trials. So good morning all and good morning to our participants as well. Uh, thank you for joining us and for sharing your time with us today. Um, and so our session is going to start with me introducing all our participants, um, the main ones at least, the ones who are going to be the panelists. And then we'll get into the discussion um related to the topic that we have today then at the end i'll leave a session for uh our participants outside the panel to to be able to ask a few questions and get some responses from the main panel so i'm going to start with introducing um the main panel itself it's a very powerful panel uh specifically representing um colleagues who have worked on law in africa both from the southern african perspective uh, from the Eastern African perspective, Western African perspective, and the United Kingdom as well. And so uh, we are going to have an interesting session today. I want to start by introducing Professor Ambrina Manji, um, who is, um, I cannot yet see her here, I'm not sure if she's managed to join. Um, but Professor Ambrina Manji, even if she joins us later or is here somewhere and I can see her, is a professor of land law and development. Um, as well as the director of the Center for Global Law and Justice at the University of Cardiff. Welcome, Professor Manji. Thank you for being here. And importantly, she's the former director of the former director of the British Institute for Eastern and Southern Africa, and she ran programs there in Nairobi for a period of four years. And from what I hear, she's still involved there. So it's to be good to have her here today in this session. I also want to introduce Professor Disney who is a professor of public law at the University of Cape Town, and she's the director with Diana Jeffers on the Center for Law and Society, which is also situated within the Faculty of Law at the University of Cape Town. She's also the NRF's chair, um, such a chair um, in security and justice at the University of Cape Town. Dr. Azubike Onuro Guno is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law and Department of Jurisprudence and International Law at the University of Ilorin in Nigeria. And Dr. Tinene Njibanda is a senior lecturer in law in the, in the Faculty of Law, specifically the Department of Private Law at the University of Zambia, and she's a former associate uh, dean for undergraduate studies. But importantly, she's also the head of legal, the legal division for the South African Institute um, of Policy and Research in Lusaka, Zambia. Lastly, and importantly, our practitioner um, is the project director for the African Legal Information Institute um, at the Democracy and Governance Research Units of the University of Cape Town, Ms. Maria Badeva Bright. And so, welcome to this particular session. I hope it's going to be interesting. Um, if I've not introduced myself, I'm the chair for this session. My name is Dr. Olivia Luabukuna, um, based in the Faculty of Law at well, it's called the Department of Law, School of Law, um, in, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. And before that, I've worked in Eastern and Southern Africa, a former student at the University of Cape Town as well. And so um, this is a topic that is interesting to me as much as it is of uh, interest to all of the participants and panelists. Thank you for being here. And so perhaps to start, to start on this discussion, um, I found something interesting, which I feel will set the theme uh, for the discussion we have. I read a book by Nanjala Nyambola. It was a very interesting book. Um, it had a lot of steam around Centers for African Studies in, in Cambridge at SOAS, somewhere around 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was a book on digital democracy and analog politics, specifically looking at the, the internet era and its influence on trans forming politics in Kenya. And somehow in the acknowledgement session of Nanjala's book is this particular statement. She says that it takes a village to complete a project of this depth and breadth, referring to the book she had worked on, and that she was especially grateful to our e-village that believed in her and the particular project. 
but she goes on and I'll quote that research anywhere is difficult and it's a difficult process, but especially so in a developing country and outside the bounds of a bricks and mortar institution. And she puts in brackets, we need open access now. The painful process of trying to make this project happen has reified my belief that to truly decolonize the university and the academy, we must work on access to knowledge. I would like to thank everyone who sent journal articles, carried books in their luggages, um, in their luggage, or sent ebooks to my e-reader. So I specifically refer to that note and that acknowledgement because I feel it coaches the discussion that we are having today. Nanjala has been educated in Europe and United States, in Birmingham and Harvard, both in African studies and in law. And so in writing this book, she was already placed in a position to first of all access information. She already had a e village, the likes of Oreo Colo and everybody else she quotes in the acknowledgments. And so she does not even reflect the average person who would be writing on this particular area. But if she highlights these other, other uh, issues, then they're even much so for average people and average scholars working within the African context, trying to research on this area, but also for students who are maybe not based in Africa, but they're based in other parts of the world, also trying to research and work on this area or study, or for scholars who are trying to teach this particular part of the, the legal discipline or knowledge in general. And so I think uh, uh, the, the, the highlights she points out can be reflected in the discussion we are having today. It, they essentially embody the discussion we are having today. And so perhaps to start off with our discussion, I would like to set out a question to all of you about what decolonizing access to and legal knowledge means to you. What is what does decolonizing access to knowledge or decolonizing legal knowledge mean for you as legal academics or scholars or practitioners of open access? I'll start with Professor Manji and then we'll move on to Professor Smythe and we'll move on to Maria, then um, Dr. Banda and then eventually Dr. Zubike. Professor Manji. Thank you very much, Olivia, and thank you for all of your work and that of your colleagues to bring us together. Obviously, we would all like very much to be in a room together, but this is, this is what we have to, to do for now, and it's, it's great to see so much interest in the, in the event. Let me start just by saying a little bit about my background, because it's the context by which I, I come to some of the, the broad ideas I want to um, touch on today. So the, the first thing to say is I'm a Kenyan uh, legal academic based in the UK, but I come very much out of a, a kind of a critical law and development stable. Um, so I was uh, lucky enough many years ago now to be a student of, of Issa Shivji. Mm -hmm. And anybody who has been taught by Issa or been in a room with him will know that it's uh, transformative to, to be taught by him. First of all, unsettling and then transformative because Issa and the teachers who I was uh, exposed to at that time, this is, um, when I was studying at, at Warwick in the law school there, the teacher's method was really to break you down completely, to break down any of the assumptions with which you'd come to your legal studies and then to build you back up from there as a, as a group. And there was something I think really transformative about that time um, and about that way of teaching and it's a, model of teaching on which I've, I've tracked this. I then spent some time in the, on the campus in Dar es Salaam and then at Makerere very early in my career. And again, those things really uh, shape the way that you, you think about your, your legal research and about your practice as an academic. Um, and my, my research has, has always been reasonably wide. So I write on land law reform as the kind of main body of work that I do, but I've also written widely on, on legal education and particularly the history of legal education in, in Eastern Africa. Um, I've written on, on law and literature, so I have a, an ongoing interest in literary studies and, and literature and on, on women in the law. And when I ran the BIA in Nairobi, one of the great joys of that institute was that it was so multidisciplinary that on any given day, you could be meeting people from across all the so social science and humanities 
disciplines. So I've always felt confident to dip in and out of those, those various disciplines. That's important background, I think, because it tells you a little bit about how I came to some of the more recent work I've been doing, which is in relation really to the politics of knowledge production and, and the politics of uh, the dissemination of knowledge and how, how we might um, confront just how inequitable our current structures of knowledge production and dissemination are. Um, so, so one reaction by me has been simply a personal one. It's never going to change any structures, but it's an important one to, to do, which is that I've become a bit of a, a kind of guerrilla emailer in the sense that uh, if anyone wants to drop me an email and say, you know, there's an article behind a paywall here, could you send it to me? We have access to our own institutional databases, which are very rich, and it takes me all of 30 seconds to download a PDF and send it on to a colleague. It's never hard for me to do. And I always, you know, we always joke with, with each other, this, this, is, this is our kind of small paywall chini kind of movement you know it's not going to change the world but it's what you what you can do and if and if anyone is listening whoever wants any materials are very welcome to dm or to write and i'll do that for them but that doesn't really deal with the structural problems with which we're confronted which is the 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 the, the, the work that the paywall does and the work that these inequitable systems of knowledge production and dissemination do is that they they make many of us simply the subjects always of knowledge, rather than not knowledge producers and makers in our own right. And so um, what we are confronted with is, is Eurocentric ways of understanding the world and the kind of accretion over many, many years of these Eurocentric ways of seeing the world, which are not just frankly boring and narrow, but also um, that actually have important effects they 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 cause epistemic violence uh, they they cause the marginalization of certain ways of thinking and wanting to be in the world but they also and this is from the point of view of lawyers they also are the dominant uh ways of seeing the world by policymakers and lawmakers when it comes to time to think about for example legislative change so, and I see this a lot in my work on, on land, that the dominant approach to land has been one that has been framed and made elsewhere than the continent and the marginalized voices on land. So those who think about land or who want to write about and those who might think about land in a different way are the marginal voices. I'm thinking here the Kenyan scholar, uh, Ogoth Agenda whose work I think should be absolutely at the center of our curricula, but who actually is a kind of a, until recently, a, a marginalized and lone voice on, in his scholarship on um, the African commons. So how do we chisel away at that accretion of often male dominated uh, Eurocentric knowledge and how do we contest and challenge that um, knowledge and I, I think that's that's the for me the, those are the kind of important questions of the moment and I've been thinking a lot about how, how gatekeeping works so it's not just um, that gatekeeping goes on because we know that but the really interesting question is how do we um, work out the, 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 the mechanisms by which gatekeeping goes on. Divine Fu, who many of you will know, has recently written about um, how publishing is an act of violence. Uh, and I think what he means by that is that the process of writing and putting our ideas forward and trying to get those ideas out into the world often entails a kind of epistemic violence and, a, and an attempt by others to try and hem came in our, our ideas and the effect that they have. Um, so the, I've been increasingly interested in how ideas have been expunged from lawmaking and particularly from African lawmaking in relation to land. And, and this, this seems to be to occur across a range of disciplines. I was at a seminar recently um, at which just in, in passing someone very prominent with a lot, a lot of influence, 
referred to uh, Kenyan elections as never having really been driven by ideas. And it was lucky we were on Zoom because otherwise I would have really, I felt like I wanted to <laughs> reach in and uh, punch them. Because it seemed to me, it was such. I, it was such a. It was such a uh, impoverished way of thinking about uh, Kenyan politics and, and our history, um, and 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 um, it, it reminded me of conversations I've had, for example, with um, Grace Musilo, who, who many of you will know, is the Ken Kenyan literary scholar. We've, we've talked a lot about how we need to write intellectual histories and how we need to think more about the history of ideas in relation to, to our countries. Um, and it seems to me that we've lost touch with um, the, the, fund the core, the histories at the, at the core of, for example, our law schools and our legal education. Um, so I've been very interested in the cusp, what I call the cusp colonial years, the period just after independence when African, new African law schools were founded and thinking about, you know, what it is, what it is that in that period, the main drivers and, and promoters of legal education wanted to achieve. So I'm thinking here of someone like Kwame Krumah in Ghana or even Nyerere in relation to uh, students on dark campus. What were they thinking? Like what, what were the intellectual drivers of that period? Um, so, you know, unlike now, the, the lawyers didn't sit separately from the political scientists and the historians. If you read about Dar es Salaam in those years, if you read Intellectuals on the Hill by Issa Shivji, you'll see they taught, they thought together, they socialized together, they, they taught their courses together, and often that was driven by students. It's interesting to think of that now when we, when we watch our young people leading our movements, that young people, students were leading student protest movements in Nairobi and in Dar es Salaam saying, this is not how we want our curriculum to look, or, you know, go away and think about this again. Um, and it seems to me that we, we have to re reconnect with that history if we're going to do anything to challenge this way of thinking about, about uh, for example, Kenyan elections. So to, to say Kenyan elections are not driven by ideas, is simply to buy into this this model of of our elections as you know just one event after another just one damn thing after another another um no no devoid of context devoid of 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 uh intellectual momentum um so and and unable to see that actually these these events elections are driven by ideas in between it's much harder to do that work it's much easier to say oh well you know this election was simply about this mobilization of this ethnic block etc if you want to write more deeply about our politics and our law you need to think about how ideas have been contested and about counter movements and about the Hello, it seems we have lost Abrina there. And while she is trying to get herself together again, I want to give this opportunity. I'm not sure if I had essentially highlighted the way um, the discussion should go, but I feel from my discussion, I can easily move to Professor D. Smith's discussion because it brings in the South African context and the whole point of the fees must fall and, and the curriculum must change and the work that is actually being done at the University of Cape Town within the the Law and Society Center, but as well as within um, the rest of the law faculty. Abrina, <laughs> we've just skipped I'm, a bit. Of course, <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. Unreliable we'll internet. Okay. Yes, yeah, we'll come back. Yes. Of course. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, let me let me let me move on then um, uh, from where Abrina was at. Um, so I come to this topic um, very much through an engagement with my own positionality as someone who um, grew up in South Africa, who went to law school for the first time, um, sort of in the last gasps of, um, of 
apartheid, um, didn't find any engagement at law school with the politics of law and what law was doing in this, in, in this country and the violence that law was doing in this country, um, and so left. Uh, and eventually went went uh, uh, you know went went back to um, to study law, but always very aware of the the politics um, um, of law. And most of my work um, centers around violence um, and um, kind of legal engagements with violence, but also the violence um, of law. Um, and I'm particularly interested in uh, in criminal law and the uses of criminal law uh, and the abuses of of, of criminal law. Um, and the kinds of institutions that um, that it enables and legitimates and um, um, and, and supports over time, um, but I'm also a kind of an insider outsider to the world of law and society, which is really my my sort of uh, academic um, home. So again, having studied. Um, uh, in South Africa, and then having studied um, for quite some time at, at Stanford, um, which is a, which, which makes you an insider. Um, at, in, if you study in South Africa and you and you and you're living in South Africa and you're living in, in Africa, then I feel like you're a perpetual outsider to um, to much of um, to much of this kind of academic um, um, world. Um, and, and to be positioned in that way means that you experience multiple professional exclusions. Um, and so even when you're kind of trying to, um, to do those things that scholars in the global north um, do, it is just that much more difficult. It's that much more difficult because of uh, data costs. It's that much more difficult because of flight costs. It's that much more difficult because of just our horrible exchange rates. Um, it's that much more difficult because uh, of the kinds of things that Ambrina was talking about, because actually there's a level at which this world just doesn't exist beyond being uh, an interesting case study. Um, and so, you know, for me, I've been very much uh, kind of in, in, in engaged with that um, uh, positionality. So being at Stanford, um, I, uh, I thought this is a this is a place at which uh, I'm going to find some level of engagement with um, uh, with Africa, and there was just none. I mean, I was amazed having access to all of those databases behind those paywalls. Actually, how little there really was. Um, all of those books that purported to be international takes on XYZ or global takes on XYZ. And I would open them up and I page through and I try and find the, even just the one little chapter on Africa and it wouldn't even be there. There would be no um, even uh, excuse really given for it. I mean, there, it, it's not like you would find um, um, uh, a little gloss on Africa. Just it was just absent. It was just not there. Um, and so I started having these conversations with people about, you know, why don't you have Africa in your global book? Uh, and the pushback on that was always, well, we couldn't find anything. We couldn't find anything. We couldn't find anyone. Um, and so I became quite obsessed with finding those things and finding those those ones. Right. So uh, kind of um, uh, putting all of that together. And I I didn't really. Um, um, I mean, I thought that was a relatively easy job, actually, um, until I started putting together um, a course outline for a course that I taught on law and society in Africa. Um, and I was very clear from the start that this was going to be a course that was centered on the work of African scholars. It was going to be a course from Africa, uh, about Africa. Um, and, um, and I really struggled to find these materials that I thought would just, again, kind of be there, you know, that my commitment to, to, to doing this would make just, um, just make it so. Um, and so I did a sort of a survey of um, all of the leading law and society journals. So the Law and Society Review, um, uh, the Journal of Social Legal Studies, the Nyati Social Legal Series, Canadian, so on and so um, In all, there were 3,012 um, articles that I looked at, starting from 1964 through to 2017. Um, and the reality that confronted me was really stark. Um, there were um, fewer than 2% of all of the um, authors who'd published over that time were African scholars, whether from the continent or in the diaspora. Um, and Brina, I think you published two of those, <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> um, and, and fewer than 3% of them even mentioned Africa. So, and then there were big, 
chunks of time when there was just nothing published, like a decade in which there would be absolutely nothing that even mentioned Africa. So when I say mentioned Africa, that would be an article, for example, that dealt with um, amnesties. Um, and it would talk about Northern Ireland, and it would talk about Chile, and it would sort of mention South Africa, or things, but you know, nothing actually um, uh, substantive. So there was the paucity of material on Africa. And then there was the narrowness of it that was really, really striking. Um, so this was scholarship that focused on uh, violence, ethnic violence, uh, genocide, the kind of sequel of, of um, uh, uh, um, uh, TRCs were, were, were big for a period of time, um, gender-based violence, um, marriage, but also not really kind of so, so always exoticized. Right. So, so, so this is about sorrows and leverists and, um, uh, you know, um, uh, widow marriages and, and, and things like that. Um, in fact, I mean, interestingly, I think the most downloaded article, I haven't checked recently, but the most downloaded article on um, Law and Society Review deals with the organ trade in Cairo. Um, you know, Africa focused one. And it's like, there are not that many people who are interested in the organ trade in Cairo, right? It's just, it's one of those, you know, you write an article about FGM and you're going to, uh, you're going to get cited. So it's those kinds of, um, those kinds of articles. Um, and then HIV. So it's really sort of, it's sex violence disease um, that features really um, highly. And what you don't see is, um, I, and I think this is this is this is almost as important as what is there. So what is there tells a story about Africa, but what isn't there also um, tells a story in its absence. And what you don't get with that is the theory building. So you really do get Africa as a case study. Africa as a case study for these really exotic. Um, kind of topics um, that are very African in, uh, you know, some kind of exotic conception of, of Africa. But what you don't get is the stories about, well, not the stories really, the articles that are about institutions, about the profession, uh, that accretion of knowledge over time that Ambrina was talking about, the accretion that builds theory um, over time, uh, because there's there's this pushback to African scholars of, you know, don't do the case studies, do the the, the theory work. But theory work is done in conversation over time. These built understandings. It's not something that we do kind of just you know individually um, um, on our own. So that steady flow of scholarship, um, the the theory building about practices and so on. That that has. Um, very much for me being absent from um, uh, from the scholarship um, and so I think what that means is in part and, and this is so, so just to, to perhaps um, say that one of the things that um, um, that we've done is um, so. I, so I, I, I teach this course um, on African law and society, um, and I'm very proud of the fact that out of 54 readings, 50 of them are written by African scholars. Um, most of them drawn from the African continent, and that's really important for me because um, because I I I think that there um, that kind of insider outsider differential access is really um, uh, important. So. Um, so I have this course, but also last year um, I was able to bring to Cape Town a group of fabulous um, scholars um, who actually taught a course on law and society in in, um, in Africa, and we had a workshop following that um, uh, on teaching uh, law and society in Africa. Um, and I'm going to raise this point there about. Um, uh, you know about looking back these into the, about intellectual histories um, and uh, and following that I try to get a copy of the Dar es Salaam debate um, and uh, it was sort of late and I had this one click um, thing on Amazon and uh, so I, I kind of went on Amazon and I found this copy and I was just about to press the button 
And I realized, oh my goodness, it's 895 US dollars. It's not 895 Rand. Um, and so, and therein lies another problem. So it's not just, you know, it's not just the, the kind of the contemporary work and the contemporary access, but it's also how expensive some of these materials um, are. Uh, and so I've been asking those questions about where the intellectual property rights lie in these materials. I mean, is it just that they haven't been republished, uh, right? You know, it's, um, is somebody actually getting, you know, any kinds of royalties from them? I don't think so. Um, so, so we don't have access to those materials because they're so, so, so expensive um, and so inaccessible. Um, and nobody's actually, uh, nobody's actually benefiting in any way um, from them. So, yeah. That was an interesting discussion from um, Professor Smith. And it really ties closely into the discussion that um, Professor Manji just gave us. Um, going back to um, the, 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 the little session I had at the beginning that when we talk about access and decolonizing, we are talking about the means of teaching, the means of researching, the means of transferring this information. Um, and the limitations that are found within all those particular means. And it's, it's particularly interesting to hear that there's actually already work being done, but it's being done in silos and it still has limitations. Um, I know that Abrina and, 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 and um, Dee um, are already working together and finding ways there forward, but then would like to move this forward. And they, the two of them are probably professors at a level of engagement that um, has taken a long period of time and they've built their scholarship over a long period of time. I also want to hear from those scholars essentially who have studied within the African continent or outside it, are working and teaching um, at, at legal um, institutions on the African continent, um, whose research also has been transnational, whether it's from human rights in Africa, applied human rights, human rights and development. Um, and just to hear their views, and I'm sure they'll build into what the two of you have been discussing. Um, I'm going to start with um, Dr. Banda, and then I'll go to Dr. Azubike. Um, Dr. Banda, you've worked both uh, you've worked in Africa, you've been in educated outside Africa. Just, just to hear your experiences, both in terms of getting that particular education, but coming back and working within the African context, and also working at the center of policy and research. Thanks, Olivia. So um, thank you so much to SOAS and UCT, um, to you, the chair, and to my colleagues for this platform. I'd like to tie your, so I was educated both, on the continent and outside the continent. I'd like to tie your last question to the first question that you asked, which is what decolonization means. So these are just my thoughts based on the helplessness that I felt um, as, a, as a researcher, as a student of law, first and foremost, as a researcher and now as a teacher of law. So decolonization to me, as a starting point would be no longer being a research entrepreneur. So what you described in that first quote of having to beg for access to paywalls, having to, <laughs> yes, that entrepreneurial spirit that we know so well is to do any kind of work, particularly in the context where I work. I can't just sit at my desk and start to do research. My students can't do that. Secondly, is freedom from this tyranny of the conceptual framework. So Dee talked about theory building and all of that. You're, I remember being a PhD student and having to frame my intervention within these existing conceptual frameworks. So that again, um, for me, decolonization would mean freedom to create to actually create conceptual frameworks. No longer not being able to give access to my own work. Okay, even if I, I publish something, I can't give access. <laughs> I can't give access to my own work and ideas. 
and it's incredibly frustrating. Yeah, yeah so it's ownership, it's control. It's the time and space to create. I mean, I, I in the context of a resource stretched higher education um, system, for example, where I work, where you're teaching so many students, um, you're teaching so many classes, there, that freedom and space just isn't there. So when we talk about decolonization, it has to start there. And also, as they say, if something is repeated long enough, people tend to believe it. Well, what is out there in the Zambian context? The, the, the law that is out there, the law that is curated, is the law that stems from the colonial era. That is what is available. It's not that indigenous law isn't being made. It's that it's not available. So what we read, what we teach, is basically that is what's available as a colonial law so for me those are just some some starting points based on my own experiences having to beg for access to these exclusionary spaces right without the ability to create one's own space and perhaps if I may follow up just for your case, has there been a difference in experience between, for instance, when you're doing your PhD outside the continent and accessing information there, as opposed to now being able to access information when you're on the continent for you to write? And by difference, I mean, could you find the, the, informa the exact information you needed for the context you wanted to write when you were there? Um, or even when you're in places like um, the way Bill was talking, even when you're in places in the worst where you could actually access the information, perhaps maybe it was not the, the kind of information that you'd have wanted to access. And so you find that perhaps your limitations while you are outside the continent are similar to the limitations while you're within it, just framed in a different manner. Yeah, so uh, what Dee said totally resonated with me. That was my experience as well. Um, I was struck about when I, when I, I went to graduate school, what struck me was how much information there was. So there were all these libraries, all of these resources, physical and digital. And even within that context of so much information, there was still not enough information or not the type of information that I was looking for. The other thing that struck me is I could find old newspapers, Zambian newspapers in these libraries that I know I would never be able to find at home. So there was a contradiction of <laughs> they had um, sort of part of our history that I could never access here on Zambian soil. I could access in America, newspapers going back 30, 40 years, that, that always stays with me. I mean, I was amazed to see the Times of Zambia, the Daily Mail, um, all of these bulletins curated. Um, so I think that the challenges were different, but also the same. Um, you're able to access information, but if it's not useful information, um, then you're almost back where you, you started from. Thank you very much, Dr. Bander. Um, Dr. Azubike, you have been educated primarily um, within the African context, but you have also worked within Southern Africa, Western Africa, and the US. Um, what have been your experiences so far with their all concept of accessing knowledge or limitations in accessing it, specifically legal knowledge. Um, um, and also how has uh, those influences somehow um, found their way into your legal scholarship as a student, but later on um, as, as, as an academic? Thank you, Olivia. Um, let me also thank SOAS and uh, UCT for this wonderful opportunity. I want to also thank one of my great mentors, Dismit, 
Thank you for the impact you had. Um, so coming into this, this discussion, I, I trace what sparked my interest in this area, basically as uh, a law scholar. Uh, I started uh, when I came in contact with the African Human Rights Moot Court competition, uh, when I represented my university in Dar Salaam. Now the discourse was on customary law and it bordered around about gender issues. So it sparked my interest. Going forward, I became privileged to be a candidate for the Human Rights and Democratization Masters in Pretoria, which I did in 2008. So here, I became exposed to international law and human rights issues. Getting in to do a PhD at some point after I started teaching. I remember writing what I felt was a very great conceptual framework for human rights when I was doing my research. And I gave it to my supervisor, Professor Michelo Hanson Gule. And after he read it, he called me, we sat down in his office and he was like, what does rights mean in your village? And I looked at Prof. Here I am, I have looked at Dembo, I had looked at all the scholars that had talked about rights and everything, Donnelly and all of them. And here is Professor Hanson Gule asking me, what does it mean in your village? So this sparked another line of interest in me. During my field work, I had to interact with people in my localities, in the, uh, the three major ethnic groups in Nigeria to understand, did we have anything called rights? And from proverbs, from folklores and all of that, I was able to come up with that understanding that yes, we had an African perspective to some of these things. But what was happening, we were not in the literature we are not available. That became a source of challenge and, and worry. Then at that point, I came in contact with Law and Society Association. So when I attended my first Law and Society Association, it was a massive conference. It was so busy. We tried to look for African scholars. We tried to look for people who could take us on the next level. And in this, I met quite a number of African scholars. I met the Downies of this world. I met the Obiora or Kafos of this world. And we started exchanging. And with the great work D, you know, she's been on in Cape Town trying to mentor a number of African scholars. I remember coming, now coming home and trying to bring this into my teachings, trying to get my students to begin to appreciate from a law and society perspective. But here is the basic challenge. Within the university, like Banda was saying, that I feel there is a pull and push factor that is happening to us. When I wrote my first book, Development and the Right to Education in Africa, wonderfully published by Palgrave Macmillan, I see it out there on the internet, but my students can't buy it. They can't assess it. But why, if I had an option to publish in Nigeria, would I? Definitely, my answer would be no. And why would I say no? Now, when we come to our grading and appraisal systems in the universities, at least for Nigeria, I know. You have certain scores for what is called local publication. And you have certain scores for what is called national publications. And you have certain scores for what is called almighty international publications. And Everybody, the more international publications you have, the better you are, the better scholar you are said to be. So I look at my CV today, and I was telling somebody a few days ago, oh, I think I've sh really changed myself. I don't have national publications. I have to begin to think of publishing with Nigerian journals. All the publications are international because that is... The, the, the stamp we need to show that we are scholars. So it, it, it's that push and pull factor. And how do we get around curing these deficiencies in our systems? 
currently, oh, the university says uh, for you to be promoted, you need to have your articles published in Schemago and all of that. And they have taken my time to search through. Where are African journals in Schemago? I look at, I find only one law journal in Schemago. And then what are we, what are we talking of? Then the next steps is I need to begin to think of the Oxfords. I need to begin to think of the Cambridge. So again, the same push factor. What is then happening to us? A few days ago, I've been reading uh, Understanding Africanness by Charles Nguena. And, the, and it opens up my thinking to a whole lot of the things we are doing to ourselves. Are we still in search for an identity? What says that a journal published at University of Ilori, Nigeria, doesn't have the same sufficient quantity as a journal published elsewhere in the world? So these are the things that, that uh, we need to begin to really think about. And I think, like I said, I always refer to D again. I remember we were in Cairo two years ago discussing these issues and bringing African scholars. And on my part, we've tried to, there is um, an international research collaboration of the Law and Society Association that I am privileged to be one of the coordinators. And we have about uh, 100 scholars from about 20 African countries trying to pull ourselves together, encourage ourselves together, and do all of that. That is one way. But coming to the teaching, again, I try as much as I can to use the works of these scholars that I am now in touch with. For I, I teach a particular course in my university called Law and Social Change. So I try to rely on some African scholars and some African materials. And through these networks, you could email someone and say, please, oh, I saw this article. Do you have a draft of it? Can you send it to me? Then you give it to the students and you try to engage them on that. So that is also a way of trying to uh, build this. But you also find that when you now come with this ideology that having been exposed or you've gone for a fellowship in Osgood Hall Law School, you're coming home, you've been exposed to a whole, of, a whole lot of literatures, and you're trying to bring this down to your student, suspicion sets in. So there, there is always a lashback, cultural lashback, religious lashback. So trying to, so I find the, the process of trying to unlearn the minds also a bit challenging because you're not now coming with African scholars who are challenging these norms. You're coming with European scholars who have challenged these norms. Then it is labeled, oh, oh no, you're coming from Canada. Ah, no, you South Africans, you must just leave us. It, 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 so it, it also has a way of pushing back on the impact you try to have. But I think all in all, um, I would say we have more work to do. We, we need to keep the network stronger. We need to build more on what we have. And maybe begin to rethink the validations that we seek in our Africanness. Thank you. Zubike. Thank you, Dr. Zubike. Um, that has been interesting, and I pick unlearning there. Um, unlearning is a difficult process for people who have been learning about a certain way of approaching things for the longest time. And this unlearning is not just for the scholars, it's, 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 it's for our students, it's, it's, it's for the systems themselves and the structures. And so um, it will probably take longer, but I'm happy with the fact that there are already things on the ground that um, essentially pushing this idea forward, whether it's in how we are teaching, whether it's in how we are doing our research and conducting it, whether it's in the collaborations that we are already setting up. Um, and so I want to introduce the, 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 the aspects to this particular discussion that is practical. That is, we keep asking ourselves how. How do we do this? How do we push it forward? But there are also people who are already trying to do this and push it forward, whether it's promoting more access, whether it's essentially um, ensuring that access is open. And for that matter, I would like to introduce and at least bring into the discussion um, Ms. Maria Badeva Bright from um, the University of Cape Town to enlighten us on how she feels about this whole discussion related to decolonizing and opening up access, questioning 
what knowledge is, is questioning what access to knowledge is, is, but also doing something about it, essentially. Maria? Yeah. Thank you, Olivia, and uh, thanks to all the panelists that preceded me. In fact, you've covered most of the things that I would have mentioned anyway, so I've had to readjust my thoughts. Uh, and in the interest of time, I know we are uh, pressured right now uh, for that. I will um, shorten what I meant to say. Um, so I, yeah, j just to introduce where I'm coming from, um, I lead a continental effort uh, called African Legal Information Institute, uh, which capacitates um, open access legal publishers at the moment in uh, 15 African countries. Altogether, we are about 16 such organizations from uh, Sub-Sahara Africa. Um, I personally started and got involved in this back in 2003, 2004, uh, at that time with the Southern African Legal Information Institute, which was the first one on the continent dealing with uh, the was functional. In fact, Tinan uh, Njibanda's uh, Zambia League was the first one uh, altogether on the continent to start publishing uh, free law, um, but Safi was the first one at the time in South Africa it was functional and operational. Um, so, a lot of women across the continent as I have been traveling and uh, um, in the efforts of setting up uh, these leads. Um, I should mention we started back in 2004 with about 500 documents of legal judgments and legislation from South Africa. Uh, we are sitting today with about 300,000 digitized documents of primary law, which is uh, uh, judgments, and now we are pressing ahead with, with legislation. Only effort in this area, I think I should mention here the Pretoria University Legal Press, which has been tremendous in um, providing access to scholarly materials, um, and in fact they should be part of these further conversations uh, on this topic. Um, and this is where we are going in uh, now as Lees, is we are looking at ways of supplementing our primary law um, with scholarly materials. So scholarly material available for users of legal information in Africa, you know, integrated search engine where they could find all African law. Um, we are working with Pretoria University Press. In fact, they contacted us last year to uh, set up a mechanism where, whereby we would be able to federate search into their material. Um, so this is, this is where, you know, my background and sort of where our efforts as Africanly as part of the University of Cape Town are at making this information more accessible. But I'd like to just highlight a few points that we can perhaps take into discussion uh, from our learnings of, uh, you know, these 15 years of free access to law to primary material. And the first one is that, and it was mentioned um, by Professor Manji um, earlier on, is really about how the access to this information in practice influence ideas and the development of law on our continent. So, um, data for African law, which also look at, so memory law, but I think that that can be extrapolated, the learnings can be extrapolated onto scholarly literature quite easily as well. So we looked at how can judges who they cite. And it was quite interesting to see that, you know, from and, and we cover primarily uh, anglophone jurisdictions, it was quite interesting to see that instead of citing each other, um, they cite more and more judges from, uh, they, they cite English cases, they cite Canadian cases, they cite basically cases that are available. So it is quite unfortunate that many, many years after, um, uh, independence, uh, you know, that the thinking is still not decolonized in that way. We are still reliant on law that is not being built in Africa. And then it was quite interesting to go into jurisdictions that have 
versus, uh, for example, or South Africa, where you can see an entirely different trend, uh, where judges are incre even even without citation system, judges are increasingly finding ways to cite each other. Uh, so we can clearly see how even 10 years of access or free access to law has shaped the way some countries that have implemented it properly has shaped the way that they engage with the law. So this is the first, uh, and in fact, I mean, we have plenty of anecdotes, you know, from the fact that uh, back in 2007, we had the Ugandan judge who later on helped us start Uganda League coming and saying, well, we want to have our own league because you know, we cite your South African judgments just because they're available on the internet and it's just that much easier to actually be able to utilize those. So this is the first point. I mean, how does dissemination actually affect uh, access? Secondly, who are the users? And currently the lease in Africa collectively uh, attract about 450,000 users per month are scholars not all of them are judges not all of them are uh, legal professionals there is a huge number of people that are your average internet people you know that have some sort of an interaction with the law that they're seeking for an explanation of the law and you know it's it's quite telling for me for for me as a person uh, with a legal background to actually see somebody who has not been educated with the law and, and I think everybody knows that, but we have confirmation through the feedback that we're receiving that law is quite, it continues to be quite a close discipline. So while you would see, you know, similar, uh, similar, should I call them difficult uh, uh, subject areas like medicine, for example, people engage with medical information a lot, with, with a lot more ease because it is a lot more digested and made available and commented than it is with law. And we see here in Africa, in Af many African countries in particular, it is a problem that people cannot find the law that is explained to them. And they obviously struggle with interpreting judgments, legislation, and so on. So that's another area that I think we need to um, we need to, as, a, as, a, as scholars in law, we need, to, we need to address, is there an avenue for us to make law more popular, you know, beyond our scholarly community? Um, and then finally, I want to uh, sort of pin on the discussion board here, the, valid, the availability of materials. Where are the archives of African legal material? And I'm still on that journey of digitizing primary law. And it was quite interesting to hear Dr. Banda earlier talking about, you know, the Lusaka Times being available in a digital format while she was studying in Cornell, but not available here. And it's quite, and it's, it, and it's striking. I mean, I was, in, I was in the United States last year in November and I, um, happened to be uh, happened to be at the conference of the Africana section of the of American libraries altogether, and it happened because I was actually having a meeting there with someone, um, and it, there is this huge archive of African legal material that is already digitized. That we are looking to obtain to be able to you know in particular gazettes to be able to uh, compile legislation collections for Africa that is sitting in, in America, that is available to Americans and to legal scholars in America, and in fact, all scholars in, in those universities, that is not available to us in Africa here. Within Africa, at the University of Cape Town, we have a collection of African materials sitting in our government publication section that is not available to my colleagues in Zambia, for example. Um, and this needs, to be, this needs to be addressed. Interestingly, when I raised the questions to the Africana Library section in the, in the States, they said, well, we are not too sure that we should give you that because, you know, there are issues around decolonization that we need to speak about. And I said, well, precisely, <laughs> you know, we need to have access to those and they need to be given to African governments and to African universities to curate, to, to, to collate and curate. Uh, going forward because that is our legal history and I think um, on that note I would like to leave these three questions open uh, for discussion including from the uh, from the audience thank you all right um, thank you very much Maria um, you essentially have tied up this discussion presenting for us where where would want to go in the future both in terms of um, making Af African law primary and secondary um, as well as African legal scholarship much more 
um, um, accessible. But also you've shown us that, you know, we don't have to start, in, and I think that was the point of this webinar, that we don't have to start um, from zero. Um, there are already uh, systems set in place and already work, people working in different areas that could essentially come together. But also there's already material out there because the point of this discussion is twofold. One, to essentially push for more um, African scholarly publications, good quality publications, to push and support more African journals, um, specifically legal journals, to be actively accessible, but also push for quality publications within those journals. And to find African legal scholarship that is already out there that is really good, and this takes me back to Abrina's discussion, whether we're talking about Issa Shivji's writing, we're talking about um, Koti Kamangas at the University of Dar es Salaam, whether we are talking about um, John Barolo in Namibia, if, if we are talking about Joe jo Loka Onyango in, in, in Makerele, all these are essentially African scholars who have digital, who have archives, archives of information that would essentially allow us to push forward this discussion and give us context. And so we don't have to start from scratch. It's a matter of being able to make this information accessible and also be able to create future scholarship out of this currently information that already is in existence. And so it's not like we are starting from zero and that's why uh, the digitization, the bringing this information to a place where it's accessible becomes important. And perhaps as um, a way of tying up this discussion, what would each one of you want to see going forward for, for law as researched, applied and practiced within Africa, individually, but also as a group? What would you want to come out of this? Because we essentially set this up as a clarion call to move this forward and bring those silos together. So I'm going to again start with Abrina and then we'll work our way down. Thank you, Olivia. So, so I think I would, what I would like to see is really um, detailed work to support the initiatives that we've been hearing about. And there are a few also being mentioned on the chat and in the, uh, in the discussion amongst the panel, uh, amongst the audience. So there are initiatives that we should be supporting and they range all the way from the production of excellent textbooks, for example, in Nairobi. I'm thinking here of textbooks on constitutional law, land law, thinking of Strathmore University Press, for example. Um, we should be supporting those initiatives. We should be supporting our journals. And we should be really having the difficult conversations about what do you mean by excellence? And I think we have to have that conversation also at the level of institutions. Why do you only expect to promote people if they publish in international journals. What is your benchmark for what international is? And why do you police the boundaries of what you call excellence so uh, in, in this way? But also I think we have a responsibility for those of us who are not living on the continent to, to challenge that on our part and to say, you know, my scholarship also needs to be and will be published on the continent. Those are my interlocutors. I am not interested in uh, publishing my work in UK law journals where, as Dee said, they're a little bit of an exotic case study. We also have a responsibility to think about where we publish our work, who we want our readership to be and where, where we want to build our readership and where we encourage our PhD students to, to publish their work. I think in that regard you can have such an enormous impact as a PhD supervisor, for example, and as somebody who's in conversation with early career scholars. Support the really excellent initiatives that are going on on the continent and, and by doing so break down this idea of excellence which is used as a form of gate, gatekeeping so i talked about that at the beginning that gate, it's not just that gatekeeping happens it's the the language and the discourse and the mechanisms by which gatekeeping ha happens and one of those is to police this boundary of what we think of as excellence so i think i'd like at, at, at the level of individuals but also at the level of institutions for us to be having some of those really difficult conversations about where we choose to publish our work yes 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 thank you thank you thank you abrina um, next is, uh, Dee, can you follow up on what Abrina said with sure, the sure. comments? Yeah, um, so I think, I, I think absolutely, I think those are, those are great points about how we support local and 
and and and regional um, journals. I think also to to point out that um, that editors of many international uh, journals are very keen to have African scholars publishing, um, and sometimes we self select out. Right, so it's also about um, having confidence that we have something to say, um, that we have something to say that can be a part of a global conversation. Um, building networks of people who can support that writing. Um, so whether it's through the um, the kind of writing workshops that the Center for Law and Society and that Umbrina's uh, Center at Cardiff have been um, organizing. Um, and I think that those things, those kinds of initiatives need to really be layered. Um, so I think we have to be careful about just having kind of one shot interventions. I think we need to work really hard at building uh, communities of writers and readers um, uh, that can support each other's um, um, work. I'm very worried about open access, to be honest, because I, I, what I'm seeing at the moment is that people who come from the wealthiest uh, institutions are able to buy open access. So it's almost like greenwashing and sort of open access washing um, the, the scholarship. And, and um, so, so far, I'm not really seeing it uh, benefiting um, Africa, other than making, you know, Scandinavian scholarship accessible to uh, uh, to African scholars. So, you know, I'm I'm really excited to be part of something that is uh, generally thinking about how, how we use that to democratize uh, knowledge. Um, and then just quickly, what we've done at the um, at the Center for Law and Society is um, we've uh, built a database with the UCT um, library um, that puts our materials that we're, so we're building a repository, it puts our materials into the UCT library and makes them accessible in that way, but is also entirely um, open access. And um, so we've spent the last year and a bit since the workshop that we had in Cape Town, working with our digital library services to build that um, uh, back end. And right now we should be doing a data sprint, data marathon, I think they call it, um, and putting all of the, those materials um, into the system. But since we're all locked down, that's been a bit difficult. Um, but, you know, that's really kind of doing uh, more of the intellectual, well, the, the collecting of the intellectual history. Um, so uh, we've been very fortunate to receive materials from uh, Professor Rick Abel at UCLA. We had a lot of, um, um, sorry, sorry, he's about to be. Um, so we had a lot of um, uh, uh, East African and West African materials that he collected over sort of a lifetime of, of, of research. Uh, Professor Sandra Berman's materials. And so we're kind of slowly working to digitize um, uh, those. And out of that, we're hoping through an international research collaborative with the Law and Society Association um, to develop a, a critical reader on um, African law and society. Um, so that's just some of the work that, um, that, that we're doing at, um, at CLS. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dee. Um, perhaps, Onora, what would you, um, Azubike Onora, what would you want to see going forward with this discussion? Um, how would you like things to be done as we move from here? What sort of collaborations and networks would you like to see coming out of your personal initiatives, but also as a group moving forward? Okay, um, I think Honora is frozen a bit. I'm going to move to Tinena Um, How would you like to move Hello. forward? Um, oh, are you back? Yes, yes. Okay, no. okay, yes, yes, yes. How would you like the future to look when we talk about law in Africa? Um, both scholarship, but as well as accessing um, hard law, primary and secondary law, for instance. Yeah, I think it's a great work that is going on uh, from the initiative uh, Maria uh, shared. It's a good one. Uh, she also mentioned the work Pope is doing. Uh, so uh, in, in the first place, I think um, we need to rework our institutions. Uh, reworking our institutions to require us. I think Umbrella said something that I picked. Uh, yet we agree that as African scholars, we move out into the diaspora space to get a, a little bit more empowered. We shouldn't forget to pull up then where we, where we were and where we are coming from. So we need that institutional support. Sometimes when I see my PhD students, I shake my head. 
they don't have the same opportunities I had. Mm. As a PhD student in South Africa, I had opportunity to attend conferences. Mm. And I share with them, I, some of these conferences, I never had to go to anybody's office. All I needed to do was to do an abstract. The abstract was accepted. And then you mail the, the director and say, oh, you're excited and something comes up, you're, you're, you're supported. You have flight tickets, but how many of my PhD students here have such supports? Then what am I expecting from them? And it comes to what, when you talked about quality, Olivia, I, I, I smiled because quality, yes, I, I agree on the base norm of quality, but, but really quality, I think we should also put that in mm -hmm. invited formats, talking about gatekeepers. I've reviewed uh, 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 an article for a journal and my response was a no-no. And by the time I saw the full uh, uh, journal out, I saw that same article without much changes. You know, so that, that, that is an aspect that we need to look at. And the research space we create for our African scholars, we need to build it up. We need more. What we are doing is fine. I have talked about the the IROC initiative that is plugged in into the Law and Society Association. I've talked about uh, the work Lee is doing with uh, African society in Africa and all of that. So a whole lot of these initiatives are the issues that we really need to, to come together around and encourage. You can only encourage, you can only motivate. I remember asking one of my PhD students, I said, look, I can't supervise you for three years and we don't have an article. We must do an article. It's not a requirement for him to graduate. So I'm beginning to think, do we make it an, a requirement in our, in our curriculum? So, but for him, I also see him struggling. There is no access. We, we've talked about access already. So these libraries are not even available for these students to get. So it's a whole lot of struggle. So you now find a student needing to push his economies first, then needing to push his scholarship. While some of us that were opportuned to be away from the continent, we didn't have any of those worries. So you could see the disparity that could always come in the output that we come up with. So I think basically institutional access and institutional repositioning for our research space is really important. And we are doing great. I think we started somewhere. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Azubike. And perhaps um Tinenji, before we get to Maria at the end, um, where would you like um the young African scholar at the University of Zambia to be positioned? Um what systems um do you see, uh, do you foresee or your ideal systems going forward for a, a, a good environment for research as well as teaching within African institutions um, that would not only promote African scholars, but also the students that the scholars um, are learning from. So just two small points at the very local level based on my work with Zambia Lee. Our, our students need access first and foremost to their own primary resource, legal resources. And one thing that, an opportunity that I think we could take is courting the gatekeepers. So in our context, those are the judges um, that are not releasing judgments or even lawyers. We found sometimes when there's an important case that we can get access to, going to the lawyers that argued the case is how we get access to that case and put it online. But what we're finding, and Maria will bear me witness to this, is some of our, our biggest users are the gatekeepers. So it's interesting on our contact feedback form, we have lawyers coming and saying, hey, could you find me the case that I argued a few years ago? And we know that judges are also very heavy users, for instance, of Zambili. So courting those gatekeepers and, and you know, making them realize that if they withhold that information 10, 20 years down the line, they'll be in need of it. As Maria said, also judges not being able to access other judges because that information is actually not there. What's there? The law reports from the, the 70s, 
you had a whole blackout of law reporting in the 80s and 90s. So those cases can't be cited, you know, so it's lost history in that sense. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, so open access. In our context, when we think of open access, we have to think, we have to go even a step, um, one step behind and talk about the nuts and bolts of even things like internet penetration, for instance. So even if we have open access, I mean, 90% of our users on Zambia Lee are in Lusaka, which is the capital. I'm a bit sad we didn't get to talk about the COVID situation because if you talk about deepening inequality in terms of we are allegedly, allegedly doing e-learning, but really on the ground, um, you realize that basic issues of internet access inhibit learning, even if hypothetically all the materials were available online. So we shouldn't forget that element that there's not, the nuts and bolts of open access starts with actually having access to a reliable internet connection. I'm happy my own connection has survived um, thus far. But, you know, I even struggle in that regard. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's where I would end. Thank you. Thank you, Tineme Angie. Thank you for highlighting um, the, the, the limitations, not both in, both in the, the content that we are talking about, but in how that content can essentially be accessed and taking us back to the question of internet. And I actually had wanted to associate the discussion on decolonization with the discussion on the current context of lockdown. Because when we are talking about inequalities, um, then they've, they've essentially been high, highlighted by, by the lockdown. And, and you see the students in certain parts of the world being able to go on and learn online and access information. And students in other parts of the world, as well as their lecturers, not being able to, to go on teaching. And therefore, their lot would probably would have to repeat a year. And this brings in probably the importance of this discussion for the current affairs both the context of Black Lives Matter and the discussion of the African person and African law and access to information and knowledge created and nurtured in Africa, but also for the discussion of um, the inequalities already existing in access to information and knowledge, representing themselves within the context of COVID and lockdown. Um, it's important, I thought it actually be at the back of our heads that this discussion when we're talking about decolonization and promoting access to knowledge, it's both those aspects. It goes all the way back to where we currently find ourselves and how our teaching is essentially being able to, to go on in other parts of the world while it's limited um, in most parts of Africa. Um, Maria, perhaps you can, you can essentially tie this up for us with um, where you want your projects to go, what you think is still missing and you need, but what, what possibilities lie in, in this yeah. discussion going yeah. forward, yes. So I'm going to I'm going to make uh, one very practical suggestion, and I think the, and, and that has been tried and tested elsewhere. So it's um, don't take credit for <laughs> coming up with it. Um, but I would like to I mean the the African Lee and the Lees in Africa have already started publishing uh, books um, written by legal scholars. So if you go on to Zimli, for example, uh, there there are four books on criminal law, on um, uh, in, well, actually for South Africans or Africanly, uh, for criminal law, human rights, etc., are already being published on those leases, open access books that students are accessing every day. So I would just like to invite uh, African scholars, I mean, to consider this as, a, as an outlet, uh, you know, the lease is an outlet of this kind of work. Um, secondly, even for papers that are going to make it one day into a journal, into a peer-reviewed journal and being published, I mean, you can, it's as far as I know, most uh, publishers are um, amenable to allowing authors to publish uh, their unfinalized paper in an open access repository. So that is one uh, call that we will be making as African League to all law faculties across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, do consider, we are going to create a repository and we are going to ask scholars to consider putting uh, their output as papers, uh, not necessarily as journals, articles as a first step onto that repository. And I think that that's, you know, starting with these small steps, um, as we have seen with primary legal materials, this 
uh, will incentivize African scholars to, you know, come out of the shell if we if we if some of them have those concerns and um, uh, publish in those repositories more. I mean, just like, I mean, we all learn as part of the learning process. Actually, we look at the work of others. In fact, Olivia, you started with this: how you build on the efforts of others, and including in law, as you look at how other judges write. You mean you, you tailor your judgments as you look how other scholars write. You learn how to write. So, take me to the second point. I mean, the, um, you mentioned that you and and your center will be creating some um, resources on writing uh, legal scholarship. Again, if that might be available for. Or, uh, open access the actual training material we would be happy to disseminate uh, those through our platforms as I said we are accessed by 400,000 people in Africa every uh, most of them uh, legals um, legal professionals or scholars we are accessed by those people and we are a good platform to reach out to those people and make it available uh, you know when I think about it the, when I think about legal writing the first thing that comes up is the our laboratory in the, in the United States it's again the, a US university if there is something African that can be published we'd be happy to uh, to hold that um, so I would like to end on the note. I mean, we invite you to publish your work via the lease in, in, in the best, in the most practical way possible, um, considering that there is still a discussion to be had around um, the gatekeepers and what the institutional difficulties around open access might be and implementing open access might be uh, for legal scholars in Africa. We think that there is still an opportunity there to be had to leapfrog some of the issues that perhaps have plagued uh, scholars in the West. So just like we did with primary materials, we don't have to have printed law reports. We can just go into digital access and maybe there is a different model that we need to explore all together in that. Thank you, Olivia. Okay, thank you, Maria. And I want to thank my panelists. Um, I've essentially looked at the Q&A session. Um, I was hoping some people would put questions here, but they're putting comments somewhere else. Um, and so here I have two questions so far in the Q&A. Um, if anybody has a couple of questions, you can put in there. And then the last five minutes, we just um, um, relay the questions to the panelists. The first one, and this is a general one to any one of you, so any one of you can pick it up. Uh, Patricia says that the tradition of in-house university journals, which are often student-led, appears to have declined. She did not clarify whether it's in Western universities and African universities. Um, she asked, do panels think that this has exacerbated the access or paywall issues they have identified? So, any one of you? D? So I'm not sure whether Patricia is speaking specifically there about US um, uh, journals um, being student led, because that's that's generally the place where that tends to um, to be the practice. Um, and uh, and if and if it is, then honestly, I can say part of my my immense disillusionment with those kinds of journals comes from actually having worked on one of them, um, and seen what happens when eight very well educated uh, students pours uh, fairy dust on a very poor draft from a very important professor, um, and so knowing the investment that actually goes into producing. Uh, those outstanding top tier journal articles um, versus again what we're actually able to uh, to do here where we you know we don't have eight students who are uh, checking our pin citations and um, copy editing for us and things we're doing that ourselves between uh, two and three in the morning with all the kinds of challenges that Tine and Azubi here have um, have pointed to um, yeah, so I'm afraid that's a that's a, a long way of not entirely answering the question, um, but just kind of riffing off it. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dee. And and the next question is essentially for Tinenengi. Uh, thank you, Tinenengi. Your your insight was especially it resonated with me. Um, so that's what Mary Page says. Um, and much of much much of what you said essentially personally um, um, makes sense for me. You say that decolonization means no longer having to be a research entrepreneur. So the question is, um, 
Any thoughts on steps that could be taken to make the process of researching Africa less cumbersome for doctoral candidates and early career researchers on the continent, but also abroad? Yeah, I mean, I think a starting point, what has really helped me is mentorship is so, so important. Um, I think having people that you are accessible, um, who have dealt with some of these challenges in a more, even a more severe way is useful and has helped me. So having someone to help you navigate the system, because it is, it's a system, it's a coded system that you have to learn how to navigate. So if you're a doctoral candidate, I'm not sure who asked the question, but I think that the PhD process is extremely lonely. Um, you basically start the process and you're told, I mean, I had at least one year of um, coursework in the US, you, you have to do some methodology coursework and whatnot. So that was helpful. But I describe it as a process where, you know, you're told, come back in four or five years with a book, basically. So I think you have to be proactive about seeking out that support um, and having someone help, having someone show you the ropes, but then also being willing to be that. Um, as you move forward. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Tenanaji. And perhaps in terms of the African context, identifying scholars, whether it's in the US or in, I mean, in Africa or UK or in Africa, that you feel um, speak to the context that you want to write about and having them not necessarily as formal mentor, but mentors, but informal mentors to support the contextual um, journey because sometimes the difficulties becomes that you have a supervisor who doesn't necessarily comprehend the context. And so it makes it very difficult for you to research. You don't have somebody to signpost you to the scholarly information you're looking for. So it helps um, also identifying both formal mentors as well as, and, and, and scholars that maybe will be identified through the institution, but also synergy um, highlighted perhaps informal mentors or, uh, on the continent. Um, and if you, if you can, um, if you do have control of the process of who, say, your, your supervisor is, that's important as well to seek out. I mean, I don't know how you can do a PhD um, with somebody that's completely di divorced from the context that you're researching. So I think also being more, and I understand what it's like you know, to be a student and apply. That's the other thing that we haven't even gotten into where you just want to get into a PhD program. So do you even have the space to start negotiating um, supervisors and whatnot? But I know a lot of institutions do allow you to do that. And I know a lot of institutions won't accept students and unless there is a supervisor I can take on that work. So I think just being very intentional in the beginning about <laughs> aligning yourself um, with people that understand the context, perhaps not perfectly, but um, in a way that will be useful to you. Okay, and I'm just going to pick one last question so that we can close this session. Um, what do panelists think about using Western scholars as PhD examiners in work related specific aspects of the law on the continent? Uh, yeah, can I can I come in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I I think basically it's about expertise. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is need for us to become more visible on the African continent um, by our works and by these networks. Then you begin to know because definitely, if someone wants to examine a student working on education law in Africa, and Azubike is not visible then the person would be looking for a Western scholar and it becomes that challenging. So I think what we are doing now by the kind of mentorships that uh, we are having, you know, I, I almost uh, forgot to mention Kelly Mount, who is also doing a great job in mentoring quite a number of Sub-Saharan African scholars. We are building a base, we are building a database that we can now fall back on for this. So I think it's something that is going to disappear 
Because before now, you wanted to read about Rwanda. You want to read about Gachacha. You're not reading an African scholar. You're reading some Western scholar. You want to read about the LRA. You're reading some Western scholar. You want to read about Boko Haram. You're reading some Western scholar. But I think that narrative is changing now because we have African scholars who are now more empowered, who are now more exposed, coming up with literature in this area. So I think it's something that will disappear in time. We just need to get ourselves prepared to be relevant. Thank you, Azubiki. And perhaps in closing, and thank you so much to all my panelists. I think in terms of scholarship, um, there's also need for scholars in Western institutions, um, both of, of African descent and those who work on Africa, to, to find the importance of building scholarships, very honest scholarships. Um, I mean, scholar relation, scholarly relation, relationships with those who are on the African context, very much um, acknowledging the limitations that distance essentially presents when you're somewhere away from the context. And so that would essentially limit all these issues that are coming up. When it comes to identifying, for instance, external examiners, it's easy to do so using people who both understand the scholarship, but also the context, if you already have these relationships built. And so I feel that there are relationships already built, but it's important to strengthen those between institutions in Africa and in the West. And for those relationships to be based in equality, and also a honest understanding that everybody's bringing something to the table. And that essentially provides a setup that we, we would need going forward, whether it's supervising PhDs, examining PhDs, or co-writing together, but from, from a position of equality, from a position of acknowledging um, the contribution that is essentially being brought in, and not just from a position of exploitation, and um, while the gatekeeping continues to be maintained in Western institutions. Um, with all that, I would like to thank all my panelists and participants. We went 15 minutes, oh, 19 minutes above the time limits that we had set for ourselves, but it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Tinene Nchibanda from Lusaka. Thank you, Dee Smith from Cape Town, um, my alma mater. Uh, thank you, Azubike Onora. Oguno from Ilorin, Azubuki and I were at the University of Pretoria together at some point. Maria Badeva Bright, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mbrina Manji, and to all the professors and doctors who were in this session. Thank you so much for sitting in this session with us and for being patient as I took you a bit over time. You have a very good day. <laughs>